And greetings from my kitchen studio in San Francisco, and welcome to BRC and Friends, a regular 30-minute Google Hangout with me, Bruce Reyes Chow, where I chat with friends and adventurers from around the interwebs. Today is the first show where I'm having two guests on at the same time, and of course, we've had some technical difficulties. So we have Grace on video, and then we have Joe on video and my phone. So we'll see how this goes. Um, so today I welcome uh, to the show uh, Grace Justin Kim and... Uh, Joseph Shea, who are professors and very, very smart uh, people, as you'll hear in a minute. Let me give you a little bit about them, though. Grace is a visiting researcher at Georgetown University. She's the author of a lot of books, Theological Reflections on Gangnam Style, which we'll talk about today, Contemplations from the Heart, Spiritual Reflections on Family, Community, and the Divine, The Holy Spirit, She and Other Models of Global and Intercultural Pneumatology, and she also is the editor of a new project, Reflections Along the Journey, Theological Narratives of Korean-American Clergy Women. She's also an ordained teaching elder in the Presbyterian Church. Joseph Che is the Chair and Associate Professor of Religious Studies Department, the Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Comparative Theology at the University of St. Joseph's. He is the author of Race, Religion in American Buddhism, White Supremacy, and Immigrant Adaptation. Uh, again, there are a lot of degrees on this show. Uh, I do not have one of those doctor ones, uh, so <laughs> I'll try to keep up. Uh, but they both are working on a project called Gotten Style, a racial, sexual, and cultural critique, which we'll get into in a minute. But before we jump in, just to remind folks that we would love for you to tweet along with us. You can tweet with me, B. Reyes Chow, or with Grace at Grace G. Sun Kim, J. I. S. U. N. K. I. M. And use the hashtag BRC and Friends. As usual, our time is going to be broken up into a few segments. The first one will be um, just about this book, and we'll probably take a significant part of the show about that. And then at the end, I'm going to ask him just some random questions, as I usually do, to get a little bit more uh, of the personalities of the folks involved. So um, thank you all for being with me today and, and uh, dealing with all the technology. Um, the collaboration that they have done is, again, called uh, Theological Reflections on Gangnam Style, a Racial, Sexual, and Cultural Critique. Dr. Chase says this, uh, deals with representations of Asian Americans in American history and the extent to which Gangnam Style continues to perpetuate some of those representations. Our book is basically a reminder that laughing at others provides a greater indictment of ourselves than it does of the others and that cultivating a good sense of humor is absolutely essential in life for God ordained and laughter as well as tears, joy as well as sorrows, fun as surely as seriousness. So um, thank you for writing this. I did get to, to read it. I did have to read it a couple times because um, it's a dense book for only two chapters, really. Um, so um, the first, first things first, though, um, how did this come about? And uh, let's, Grace, why don't you start, and then Joe, I'll switch over to you. So, uh, Grace, how did this project uh, come about? Okay. Well, it came about a couple years ago when the um, video started coming out and everybody um, got caught in the video. They were making parodies and people were writing lots of blogs and commenting. So I decided to write a few blogs on it. Um, I found the video very interesting. I thought the dance was interesting, but more, more interesting was the content of the song. So I started writing uh, a couple blogs on it, and then I just started talking with my friend, um, Joe Chen. I said, this is very interesting. I said, maybe we can work on a project together or, or possibly a book. So that's how it began, and um, we were both very excited about it. We've had numerous conversations, and we started writing, and then now the book is out. So that's how it began. That's my side of the story. Joe might have a different. So, so, so Joe, she calls you up and says, "Let's write a book on this pop culture video that is sweeping, you know, America, right? This, the United States is watching this Korean guy. How? What did you think, and why did you decide it was important to write it?" Well, I was doing. Uh, I was. I had you know, done some work on stereotype Asian Americans, and uh, and uh, Gangnam Style uh, is a uh, fit into that. I mean, uh, you know, Maybe part of the some of the you know, some of the uh, critique that's been coming out is that maybe now uh, people laugh at him or laugh with him. That the, you know, the, the both sides to this, but you know laughing at him, uh, in part maybe because he fit into some of the you know, stereotypical age, uh, you know, the stereotype degrading stereotyping an Asian American. So I have, you now I've been doing some work on that. So you know it may fit into that. So you know, maybe uh, so I, I told Grace that maybe we should look into that more more in depth and. Not just to write about just you know, uh, uh, the more deeper analysis of, of that. So we, we look at both both ways, uh, you know, you know, laughing at him, laughing with him, and uh, and see both 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 
uh, both perspectives on, on this. Uh, so that's how that's how we came came to work together. Great, well, Joel. Let's stay with you for a minute. So in the early part of the book, you talk about um, one of the reasons that the video was able to gain so much popularity was because it still fit in with you know approved accepted racial roles and stereotypes what, what do you mean by that i mean what do you mean when it, when, when you say that you know it, it that he still holds some stereotypes about asians asian american men and so we could it could be accepted what what, what are some of those talk about that a bit okay well there's, 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 there's two things two things going on here uh, one thing is that now his video is uh, you know, the uh, the dance routine is simple. The, mu uh, the music is you know, catchy, and that that do attract people. Uh, but I'm, uh, I'm looking a little more deeper than that. So uh, looking at contextually, meaning that when the video Gangnam Style came to the United States, or how Americans sees it, you know, we see this from a particular particular, particular framework, uh, a, a racialized framework, whether we realize or not. Uh, we, we have this long history, and that's one of the reasons why we, uh, we trace from chapter one back to the first large uh, immigrant from Asia, the Chinese population. Even before they came here, they were already stereotyped as uh, depraved heathens and uh, you know, people who are, uh, doesn't quite fit in. They're kind of uh, smelly and they, they have different kind of, kind of customs and things like that. So uh, that stereotype perpetuates uh, in time. And there's, there's a long history of looking at early group of uh, Asian, in, in this case Chinese, um, as somehow as the other. Now they 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 they, are, they, they wear this cue you know, like a ponytail. Um, the, uh, the only kind of job available for them after the uh, building the railroad was the, you know cooking or uh, laundry, the feminized job. Uh, there was a kind of stereo, uh, feminization of Chinese man from the very, very beginning. And also regarding as the other, uh, you have to remember that back in those times, now Ch Chinese, at one time in the 19th century, the, 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 uh, uh, 1870 around that time, uh, one quarter of the working population in California were Chinese. Uh, that doesn't mean the white pop majority of white pop population exposed to them. Chinese were segregated in a different town, different area, and the only. Uh, Thing most white people heard about Chinese come through the minstrel show and things like that, where they caricature uh, you know, you know, Chinese, uh, mainly Chinese at, at a time, and later on, other Asian, um, with the yellow face caricature, where a white person you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, put on makeup and dressed like a Chinese, uh, spoke with a you know, broken English. And uh, they make, make fun of they basically basically make fun of Chinese people, right, right. Uh, basically the other. So all, this is this is continual throughout the Asian American history. So uh, when Gangnam Style uh, came around, um, it fits with a certain characteristic. Uh, one is the sound like a uh, you know a, good, uh, a jester, a clown, uh, uh, somebody uh, um, we can we can laugh with, somebody who's Older, middle age, which side, which is, which side is, it, it doesn't fit other uh, K-pop, uh, young, attractive, handsome type of uh, K-pop, K-pop star. So he, he's, he's less of a threat in this, right. this culture. Right. Uh, so all, all of this fit in. So that, that's, that, that's why we traced this stereotype all the way historically, all the way to the beginning of, of the large immigration of Asians in the United States. Great. Thank you. That. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I know that when I watched it. Um, there was part of me that was like, well, this is interesting. There's a Korean uh, performer, but that whole gesture thing was the one that the piece that just made me very uncomfortable, especially as youth groups and other people were doing it. And, and it was that fine line between uh, mocking and imitating. And it was just this very uncomfortable, oftentimes, uh, every time I watched it. But everybody was doing it, right? Everybody's doing it. So. I mean, right, 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 right. Yeah. so Grace, what about you? How how did it strike you? Okay, go ahead, Bruce. What was so I was gonna say, how how did it how did it strike you when you first saw this video and and all this? Why why did you want to do something with this? Because oh, there's so many aspects to it. So actually, the one of the f first few blogs were more more on consumerism and the different lifestyle. Because to give some background on Gangnam in Korea, it's uh, you know it's just 
is a very rich, rich area. It became rich just kind of overnight. But it's a small area within the city of Seoul. So it's a little small district. And he is kind of making fun of that district and how consumerism have kind of um, destroyed people and we you know they're just doing things and wasting their lives etc so some of that is coming through the other aspect is what Joe had just mentioned about the caricature of Asian American men we have to keep in mind there's a lot of K-pop singers both men and women who are very very attractive the women are very very um, attractive you know tall and skinny and you know the westernization of beauty is just part of their outlook and then also the men are very very handsome and good-looking so when Joe and I were actually discussing this it was kind of weird that these good-looking men um, k-pop singers have never been able to kind of break through into the American music industry while as we have this kind of chubby not so good-looking guy with this weird dance this comical dance and he's able to just kind of break record like Guinness Book record and make up and you know, hit all the charts. So there is all this racialization going on. So Joe had mentioned some of it. The other aspect is um, he's kind of a non-threatening person. If if um, some other good-looking person was coming into the scene, um, they're they're kind of threatening to the male sexuality, the Westernization, the well mess, the Western male sexuality. While as um, Sai, you know, with his kind of bubbly attitude, his very, he's also unknown as a comedian in Korea. So his comic uh, routine and the way he kind of behaves, it's very non-threatening. So he is able to kind of break through. So this racialization, the stereotyping that's going on, you know, this he kind of fits into that role. So that's how we kind of ended up. Um, labeling the chapters are we laughing with him or are we laughing at him and the last chapter is on the um, theology of marginalization right. and how you know that is also going on within our society so we're kind of using this book as a platform to kind of talk about these different issues that are so um, pertinent in the Asian American life here in North America Right. Well, and, and so I'm going to stay with you, but I want to ask you a question about that. So, um, you know, it's it's fascinating that whole di dynamic between kind of the the traditionally good-looking male that you know can can take your white woman. I mean, that really is kind of that whole dynamic around. We're not going to be scared of a of this husky, you know, right middle-aged guy. But yet, if there was some that all of a sudden was seen as a sexual person that might yeah. be different which is interesting because that goes in waves right where there was a time where Asian men were hugely sexualized um, and it's just a fascinating dynamic around uh, men now let me ask you is he how is he perceived in Korea um, he's embraced people love him in Korea and um, as I said he does a lot of comic roles like you know part of the Korean television um, um, networking is a lot of the stars go on these programs. Um, it's very different from how um, it's done in Canada or in the U.S. So the stars go on; they play these game shows, and they, you know, the talk shows are more where they act, and you know, it's a more of a game show kind of feel more than here when it's a talk show and one person interviews the other person. Right. So when he does that, you know, he goes into this routine. He's very funny. People love him. That he, he makes everybody laugh so there is this comedic side of him and people love him for that and then he's also embraced as a big star that was able to break through into the American music industry and and break world records worldwide where people know him and and dance to his music since that um, video he's also come up with gentlemen and then he also did uh, he did one with Psy um, hangover and I wrote another blog about the hangover because I found that interesting where um, there is this tension between African Americans and Asian Americans. We know that tension has always been there. You know, there's a suspicion against the other um, where we can't really dialogue with the other person. We saw that in the LA riots and the other events when um, Vincent Chen was murdered. There wasn't any uprising among the Asian American community. Nobody thought it was a civil rights issue. So there is always this tension between African Americans and Asian Americans. And I, when I wrote the blog about um, size hangover, I thought it was interesting that he was able to kind of break through and work with an African American and work on this song about you know drinking and having a good time and feeling sick. <laughs> 
<laughs> I thought it was a kind of a good collaborative work which is not present um, among theologians or um, scholars or just among musicians it's not there yeah that was so that was a great blog post through. Yeah, he's able to break through these barriers that exist, and I think he did that very well with Gangnam Style and then with his other following songs. So people in Korea like him. People in Asia have embraced him, so they really like his work. Interesting. Well, I'll, I'll make sure that I include that blog post. That was a good, uh, really good blog post yeah. on Huffington about that, which is not <laughs> traditionally what academics write about, right? I mean, so I, I'm, that's great that you're doing I know. So I was kind of scared to write about that, but I thought, what? I thought about it for a while, and I asked a few people, and they thought it was okay to write about it. So I went ahead and, and wrote about it. Oh, good. Let, let <laughs> so it's on over, Huffington right now. Let me go over to Joe and ask him. So uh, there's a lot about Asian males in this, but there's also some – you all comment on uh, how women are portrayed. Can you talk a little bit about how you know women are portrayed in this video and what, what that has to say? Joe? Uh, the, uh, in terms of historically, uh, Asian women has been portrayed as either uh, – um, Dragon Lady, or uh, you know, like uh, the Lotus Blossom, the Suzy Wan type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It goes back to the uh, in the era where the uh, where the uh, um, the contract broker came to the United States, and we uh, we only want the men, the young men, to come to work here in a, on a railroad and project things like that. We don't want the women there here. Yeah, meaning that yeah, the afraid is that they might, uh, Chinese might overpopulate here. Uh, so the women has hard time coming to the United States, and the few who are here, and the only you know, they, they weren't able to find much of a job. Uh, some of them engaged in prostitution. So the still that began to emerge that all Asian women are prostitutes. And so when the, the um, uh, in 1875, uh, when the act came out, uh, I forgot the name of the act right off the top of my head. It's the Page Act. Uh, it's, is that it said we don't allow prostitutes to come to the United States, but that act was specifically geared to a Chinese woman. They don't want Chinese women coming here. They are even stereotyped as, as prostitute, and uh, so that that uh, stereotype carried on over the years, and so the, the Asian women are depicted as over sexualized, and uh, and uh, so the, you have the uh, uh, the fictitious character begin to emerge. Like the uh, you know, uh, dragon lady, uh, who's uh, who's the, who's the uh, counterpart of the uh, Fu Manchu, uh, the male counterpart of Fu Manchu, and also uh, Lotus Blossom, the, the uh, female counterpart of uh, uh, Charlie Chan. Uh, so both of them represent a like, model minority that type of figure. Uh, so Lotus Blossom is you know kind, uh, polite, submissive, uh, that kind of stereotype, whereas the uh, uh, um, the other one, um, uh, the dragon lady, uh, is over-sexualized, um, uh, domineering, mean, and things like that. Uh, so that kind of stereotype was already in the uh, uh, early you know, uh, television and radio. And it, it carried on to the present day. Uh, so that, that, that's how some of the, the Asian, Asian American women are depicted in the United States. Um, uh, in South Korea, I, I can't speak to uh, you know, that's, that's more a grace, grace area. <laughs> so she knows more about that than I do. But uh, the, uh, uh, so, uh, so that's something I want, want to bring out, we brought out in our book is just to, sh to show that you know, these, uh, Jung Young Lee, to, to whose theory we use, talk about, you know, a cent uh, in a marginal space, there's a center. Now, you know, people in the margin should appreciate who or what we are at the center, and then not try to be so attracted to the center. Uh, so it is, uh, uh, you know, we are bombarded by, with images from the center, uh, the value, belief system, all that stuff. It's very easy to pull toward the center. That's the natural human inclination to do that. Uh, on the other hand, you know, there is a value to be uh, uh, who we are as the way uh, we, we are born, the way God created us. As, you know, ex respect of, you know, appreciate of who, who we are, and uh, that, that's one of the things that I want, want to bring out uh, at the end, end of the book, that okay. the dignity of each human person. Great, thank you, uh, thank you, Grace. What do you what do you yeah. what do you say about how how women are portrayed and kind of how does this reflect? You know, it's uh, the Asian male stuff is very somewhat clear, but you know, what about women? 
Okay, so to build on what Joe has just mentioned, you know, Korea has become now number one place for our face um, plastic surgery. People are going there, well, a lot of Koreans are doing it, but people are actually going to Korea to get it done because it's cheaper, they can do it faster, they do a very good job. So this, it's this Western understanding of beauty. So women, you know, traditional women who, um, looked Asian are now looking more and more westernized. People ask, how are they looking more westernized? Well, there's the eyelid surgery, the double eyelid surgery. They're trying to make their noses um, bigger or thinner and, and taller. Um, they're trying to, they're actually sawing off their jawline to have a more narrow jawline. They're doing a whole bunch of things to their face to look less Asian than they uh, are born, uh, their features. So it's this kind of uh, moving towards the center, why are they doing it? Why is not the Asian face the face of beauty? Why do we have to alter this look? And you see that um, in the videos in the Gangnam style, where you know their their either their hair is dyed so it's not the natural black dark color. It's you know it may be a little blonde. Their faces are all altered, and that's the understanding of beauty and the hypersexualization. So the understanding that the male might be desexualized, but then the woman, you know. Going back to what Joe was saying, in um, when they were bringing women or allowing women to come, you know, the first woman I know in the Korean history, many women weren't allowed to come, so there were only a handful of women who came working um, as sex um, in the sexual industry, or they were working um, to help men. So they would work in these big homes where there'd be 50 men and they'll have to cook for them and, and clean and make dinner and do everything for them. So it's this kind of um, weird understanding of women that we're kind of there for the men. And so we're kind of um, looking at that and how uh, Western world are viewing Asian American women and Asian women. Is it just that um, we are there for our, um, their sexual pleasure, etc.? So it is a very difficult um, thing for me to look at because you know many of the women around me are kind of caught into this. How do we make ourselves beautiful in the Asian way? While you know the the center is pulling us and saying, "You Asian women don't look pretty. You have to alter your face." And that happened with um, the case with um, Julie Chen. Is it Julie Chen? Uh, where people, you know, she did her um, surgery and then everybody was upset. But you know, it's just it's a kind of almost an expectation of Korean American women or Korean women in Korea to kind of alter their faces to um, to come within the Western beauty. Yeah, I mean, I um, I travel to Asia at least once a year, and, and every time I take a picture of all of the cosmetics that are about bleaching and whitening your skin, and the, the industry yeah. of uh -huh. all that is just... It's mind-boggling to see. Well, how... that's that's the other problem too. You know, all over the world, people are women are more desirable if you're white. So that happens in India. The whiter you are, the more the less darker you are, the more beautiful you are. That happens in the Asian society too. They yeah. think that if the darker you are, you're you're a peasant. You work in the farm, so you, you know, you're not desirable. So you have to be white. So this westernization of beauty is played out in different ways. But I know in Korea, they want more uh, white faces, so there are these whitening creams. There's all this makeup to make your face look more white or yeah. makeup to cover up. So yeah, that's happening, and and yeah. And and when I, I go to the Philippines, and you know, because of the Spanish involvement all the way to the indigenous folks, the span of Filipinos from very light skin, European looking, all the way to very dark skinned kind of uh, uh, indigenous folks is really fascinating when you look at entertainment and politics and who's yeah. at the top of the pyramid and who's kind of at the bottom. All right, yeah. so I want to um, I want to make sure that people pick up this book. This is backwards, but you'll be able to see it. I'll make the links on everything. Great, it's a hold it better. No, it's upside down. There, I think it, you're holding it upside down. Great. There we go. Wait there. There we go. Um, there you go. Um, <laughs> you people should read it, and I would love to discuss. I want to tell people, don't let the size fool you. It is not a quick read. This is really very dense. It's it's very good. Um, so I was an Asian American studies major in college, so I loved I love this. Um, so thank you all for writing this. But before we go, I have some questions to ask you, just kind of to find out a little bit more. We're going to start with you first, Joe, okay? So I want 
this is a random question. What is one smell or sound that reminds you of your childhood? One smell or sound? Uh, it would be uh, a flower smell. Uh, a sound would be uh, a water. I, 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 live, I live not too far away from the river when okay. I was a kid. Great. Okay. All right. Your next question, Joe, is this. The last book you read that has nothing to do with your field of study. Oh. Uh, the last book I read. Uh, uh, I don't know the title. It's, it's just some, some kind of novel I've just picked up. <laughs> <laughs> so I was on a plane. Uh, I just, yeah. Good, good, good. Okay. And then uh, what was your first job? My first job was in the computer field. Ah. Uh, uh, you mean my 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 high school working part time? Is that what you mean, or a full time job? Uh, whatever, however, you, however you want to answer. My, my first full time, my first job, you know, as as a kid in high school, I worked in this uh, butcher shop, yeah. and uh, I had never had. Uh, that's a, st a funny story. Is that I, you know, I never had steak before, you know, really good steak before when I was a kid. <laughs> so a customer came in and ordered fillet, so I gave him a, a fish. <laughs> and he's going to complain to a manager, said, yeah, I ordered you know, filet mignon. This guy gave me fish. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then your last question. If you get switched places with one person in the world, you get all their talent, their resources, and their connections, who would it be? For one day, you get to change places with one person. Uh, one person, uh, I would uh, trade place... Uh, Probably uh, a missionary, and in, in, uh, I, I, I co-sponsor a, a, a couple, three, three uh, orphanages. Yeah, I would trade trade place with uh, uh, Father Singha in uh, in, uh, in Burma. Ah. Uh, for, for, yeah. Great, thank you. All right, Grace, your turn. Here we go. Um, one smell or sound that reminds you of your childhood? Um, maybe popcorn. <laughs> The smell of popcorn reminds me of my childhood. Okay, good, good. Um, the last book you've read that was not about your field of study. Oh my goodness, that was so long ago. Maybe <laughs> Wuthering Heights. It was so long ago. <laughs> Everything that is, is about that is years. so. All those books behind you, and they're all about <laughs> they're all your logical books. That's it. <laughs> I all have right. to read more novels at a time. And uh, what was your first job? Uh, my first job was when I was really young, maybe 10 or 11. It was babysitting. Okay. And I remember I got a quarter for an hour <laughs> my, of babysitting. My, yeah. daughter is getting, my daughter is getting $15 an hour now to babysit. I know. They're making big bucks, I'm telling you. Not mm. like when we were growing up. <laughs> I'm going to pay for college. Good golly. Okay, and then the last one. You can switch places for one day with any person in the world. You get all their talent, resources, and connections. Who would it be? I don't know. I've always admired Jimmy Carter, so maybe I would love to be Jimmy Carter for one day. Okay. <laughs> Have all his connections and resources. I think that'll be exciting. You could do a lot for it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all again for being on the show. Uh, I'll make sure I'll put the recap together. And again, everybody, you can rush out and pick this baby up. Um, let me get to my screen here and um, uh, want to again thank you, Joe and and uh, Grace for being on the show. Um, thanks okay. again. Thank you. For having Thanks, everybody, for watching. Be sure to check out the episode recap that will come up. It'll be – I'll put a link right here. You can subscribe to the video as well. Um, take a moment to subscribe. Check on all their links. I'm going to put all those on the recap there and share this episode with your friends, especially those who are interested in diving a little deeper into some pop culture and what it may mean around race and sexuality and gender. It's really, really powerful book and good stuff. So um, thank you all for hanging out with us today, and until next time on BRC and Friends, Please keep talking because there are times when silence is not an option. We'll see you next time.